Hello and welcome to Military Mantra. In this interview, we have today Colonel Shekhar Atri, who have served in the Indian Army and from the Special Forces. And in this interview, we'll try to understand his journey of joining the Armed Forces, life within the Armed Forces, and various life lessons that he has learned from his service. Thanks a lot sir, for coming on this interview and welcome. Thanks for having me, Arikas. Thank you, sir. So my first question to you would be, you know, uh, how did your journey into the armed forces start and what was your motivation back then to join the Indian Army? Uh, Akash, uh, I am a fifth generation in the Indian Army. Okay. So motivation was never missing. In fact, after my 12th, uh, I uh, joined hotel management in Bangalore as a degree course. And in between, I had appeared a couple of times for NDA exams. I had cleared the written all the times, but then I never could uh, go beyond that uh, in okay. the SSB. So uh, I was doing my hotel management pretty happy with it. And subsequently, then again, uh, I cleared a written exam. I went for the SSB and this time I made it. So I went to NDA after that. And that's my, how my journey began back in 1997. Got it. So if you could also speak about your experience back then, in the SSB, how was it? And any tips you would like to give <clears throat> to the aspirants who are appearing for service selection board? See, like most people think that once or twice, if you appear for SSB, you're not selected. And I've seen people appearing 14 times also, right? Mm -hmm. And still not. So uh, like uh, many of the aspirants, uh, I did not make it on I mean, the first chance. Uh, this was immediately before the 12th board exams that I had appeared. And uh, it was just that uh, herd mentality. Everybody was filling in the form. So I also filled in, went for clear the written, went for SSB. And it was just before my board exam. So there was a gap, right? Uh, that should I focus on the boards or should I focus on this? So I went anyways and I didn't make it. I came back and uh, next time when I cleared it, uh, this was in between my board results and the uh, before I went for my hotel management. So I said I should prepare for it. I went and uh, in Chandigarh at that time, I'm from Dharamshala. Okay. So Chandigarh was the closest uh, place to me where you could have uh, this uh, SSB coaching. So I went to coaching there for a week or so. And then I went in again. And this time again, I didn't make it. So that was my second attempt. And third attempt, I was in the hostel. Uh, doing things all by my own and uh, living the initial ragging days of the college. And then once this SSB came about, I had cleared my return again. But when I went for the SSB, this time, I believe, whatever the difference was, this time I made it. And the only difference was that the life experiences that I had in between, plus the SSB coaching, which I had taken, now started making more sense. So yes, I definitely placed some kind of guidance, coaching, mentorship, has some value, has value. It uh, shows you the path which you are doing, but then you have to travel it on. And uh, the life experiences out of hostel and being independent and so on and going through tough times. So uh, that uh, means definitely first time out of host. That made me, maybe it changed my character a bit. Got it. Be more confident about myself. And that's how I cleared my SSB in the third time. And then I, there was no look after that. Got it, sir. So, were you aware about something called OLQs, which we uh, commonly get to know called as officer-like qualities back then, that you, we are tested for certain OLQs? Akash, life was simpler back then. And uh, <laughs> we heard of the word OLQ uh, in NDA first time. And uh, there is something called OLQ, but one never bothered as to what it is. Got it. We were all... Uh, means OLQs are nothing but good human qualities, right? That integrity, honesty, hard work, commitment, all these are uh, whatever uh, contributing to being a gentleman is, I think, what is OLQ. There's no such thing that you can, uh, there's no chat GPT solution for it. Mm. So <laughs> you ha either have it or you can develop it, but... Uh, I don't think there is one size fits all. So that's about it. 
got it so if you could speak about your journey in the nda and subsequently in ima <clears throat> any memorable experience that you would like to share from your time there yeah uh nda was definitely the most memorable 3 years of my life and i would say that anybody who has gone through nda uh, would uh, definitely agree with whatever i am saying that this is the three years that made those lifelong bonds have one of the best places where one saw the value of hard work teamwork integrity and uh, i personally uh, was a good sportsman and although i was not from one of the scenic schools or so i was from a public school but i was a good sportsman i was good at boxing i got gold medal in boxing by the time i passed out and i started from a scratch mind you i had a previous i was uh, i had some training in kung fu so that i put it on to my boxing skills and i was a good basketballer and as far as uh, hard work and taking the physical uh, stress is concerned uh, i never felt it was there that i could take it on whatever the academy had to throw at me and uh, it was just uh, that uh, why i say the best days of my life because uh, one feels that kind of connection with your superiors with your juniors and you work like one unit i'll give you an example uh, in india there were at that time 15 squadrons okay and when i joined we were 14th among the 15 right in my first term so it was like the joke was that next time you'll be out of the parade ground it seems so from 14th the second term when i we started uh, we came second okay and all this uh, journey started with the the seniors who were there the officers who were managing us decided that enough is enough and uh, let's put our thinking hats and you will not believe it uh, that from second then we came first throughout the next 3 years nice. so that was the kind of team that we had developed and uh, it's like 30 uh, 20 to 30 cadets passing out every 6 months and 20 to 30 joining but still yeah. the team performance it stayed at the level of superlative excellence i can say and i really feel proud of it uh, i may was uh, india was what uh, army should be Mm. ideal army everything is works as per the routine everybody uh, contributes to it including the staff and all the people who are there the trainers instructors i may was for me an eye opening experience as to what uh, army is and in which uh, lots of unofficial things going on uh, i may spread across a, at that time was spread across a wide geography a uh, widely disconnected geography so to say that we had two or three uh, separate campuses all together where you know, okay. 3 to 400 cadets would stay and uh, it was nothing was joint right okay. and the training uh, definitely uh, the weather of uh, dehradun winters is miserable and uh, summers was even more miserable so we used to, whatever trainings we used to have uh, were really under the harsh conditions and uh, by the time we passed out yes uh, there was a better standard uh, understanding of uh, the expectations of the organizations nda we were still uh, means being nurtured towards that there was not much of military training per se but i may was purely military training based and our understanding and the case studies and whatever we went through from the experiences of the instructors instructors by the way were very very uh, uh, exceptional each had contributed in his own sense uh, to the organization many were gallantry awardees and many were skilled in certain skills which we as cadets used to really look up to them and okay. it was really a motivating period for us at the end then yes uh, after i passed out from ima i went directly to to parasif okay. and that's where my rest of the life journey has nice sir. so so what was your motivation back then to join the uh, parachute regiment or the two parasif from the academy see like i said uh, as far as the physicals were concerned i never had any issues uh, and uh, it was like i'd seen for myself uh, 
I would uh, not have issues which other cadets would have or which would. In fact, I could perform more than them and push myself more even if I could not. So uh, stay for a longer time and. Uh, uh, so that was one. So I was never afraid of the physical part of the thing. Second was that uh, I, like I said, I'm the fifth generation in the army, and my father was in the infantry. So I had seen the infantry life. Mm. So I wanted something more. I had seen my father do things that he did, but then I mm. wanted to do something more. So what uh, better place to explore than to go to the special forces? So that was was my motivation personally to opt for the special forces and then of course being lucky enough to be given one at the time of commissioning itself. Got so it. That's how it took it on. So if you could also briefly explain how was your experience in the probation? Also because you ended up becoming a colonel, what are the qualities that you're looking into when somebody is undergoing a probation? Uh, Probation, uh, personally, when I joined the academy, Operation Parakram was, uh, when joined the unit, Operation Parakram was on. Okay. So most of the uh, troops were deployed in operational tasks or preparing for operational tasks. So there was a small core group of uh, what we call as the training team, uh, which is headed by a JCO, okay. Subedar Sahib, and uh, supported by various NCOs who specialize in skills. And he was the one who was independently running this probation uh, in the rear base and uh, not much of officers monitoring him. And he was doing an amazing job. So first one month, and we were uh, taken through the accelerated phase of the probation, so to say, because uh, uh, operational experience was also important for us, especially officers. So there were two of us. And uh, in one month, what uh, is covered as a physical syllabus for three months was covered, physical syllabus was covered for us in one month. So that included uh, 5km, uh, 10km, 20, 40, all these uh, marches and runs and everything. And uh, subsequently then we were pushed up to the, with the troops and we would continue our probation over there. So uh, troops were purely in operational areas. First day I landed, I landed in the team which I was supposed to be in the evening at around six o'clock. And that was pitch dark in the month of February. So I landed and within one hour, there were two dead bodies of terrorists which were brought to the camp, okay. which the troops had killed. This is my first day with the troops, okay? And you can imagine the impact it has on you that, oh yes, I am now in the live uh, mm -hmm. operational area and it's not theory anymore or it's not just simulation anymore. So uh, probation went ahead during those operational times also and uh, like any good unit, uh, people took care of uh, testing us as well as teaching us. So there are two phases and it was dovetailed very beautifully and uh, as the probation goes, it went smoothly and by the end of three months, then I was uh, told that I would be retained. Uh, as far as probation is concerned, having been a CO also and uh, earlier as a training officer, uh, we would uh, closely monitor uh, the probationers. Uh, the character standards for everyone, from a paratrooper or a young soldier to an officer who is undergoing probation, remains the same. Okay. Uh, the physical standards expected are the same. There is no variation that uh, happens over there. Uh, character, when I say that uh, that kind of integrity that a special forces operative should have, the kind of honesty, commitment to the task, and uh, the capability to work hard without observation or supervision, Mm. Uh, because at the end of the day, there are uh, six boys who are going to go deep into the enemy territory and operate independently. There's no oversight. Got it. Nobody will be telling them how to work. So they should mm. be uh, people who are reliable. Yep. It shouldn't happen that you are being told to go 20 kilometers, you go 10 kilometers, sit down and say I've reached 20. Uh, so <laughs> that kind of thing, even if a doubt is there, uh, whatever I used to say, that the benefit of doubt should go to the organization. That if you have a doubt that the person has cheated or not, 
the assumption should be that he has cheated so the benefit should go to the organization mm. rather than the individual uh, because uh, organization matters more than the individual right? correct and organization like special forces or one mistake uh, will have a national repercussion so we cannot uh, take a chance with so that was the thing and uh, secondly uh, for officers uh, thinking with uh, under stress taking decisions under stress so officers generally tend to be evaluated more apart from the physical standards and this character traits they are also evaluated on their thinking capabilities taking decisions uh, under stress so that kind of uh, assessment is also there so these are three major facets for especially for officers which we take into mind and last but not the least is that uh, how does the team feel about it? Mm-hmm. how do the other officers feel about it because in a uh, probation is for a period of 3 months so uh, you can fool one person right i am the ceo mm-hmm. he meets me once a week and whenever he meets me he is like very up and about mm-hmm. but the training officer he meets on a daily basis so two days out of five he is up and about and three days he is like being lazy mm. and the training nco he meets 24/7 because he is sleeping in the training lines the training nco is living with him so uh, if there is anyone who says that no this person in front of you does something in front of him does something and in front of him does something so if somebody is trying to put on different masks then we if one person feels strongly about not keeping him like i said then if it or doubt goes to the organization got it so that's the thing got it sir that way so since you you were a paratrooper if you could uh, describe your first experience when you jumped out of an aircraft and eventually how was your experience when you did multiple jumps later on uh, well uh, surprisingly i jumped before i became a paratrooper okay so i was in ima and from ima they take out this uh, ah, yeah. hikes yes uh, for uh, para jumps in sarsawa hmm. so but the experience is different i'll tell you how in sarsawa you jump from a, a helicopter. helicopter yeah and it was yeah so uh, our first jump was uh, and the jump is the drop zone is right next to yamuna river hmm. and once the helicopter is at 1200 feet uh, you can see that um, it will take into consideration the drift wind drift and all so first jump the helicopter dropped us right over river river yamuna and uh, when the parachute open we look down that it is yamuna and if we go inside we are like it's so much of rigging and everything it's a difficult task so most of the guys started shouting bachao 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 and some of us started shouting oh maza aa gaya kaisa hai tu aisa we were shouting at top of our voices and while we were coming down and uh, luckily all of us landed in the drop zone and after that uh, the instructor calls us and with all our parachutes so uh, we are supposed to pack our parachutes and put them in the vehicle mm. and then we are going to take them back to the base the base was around 8 uh, 9 kilometers so he called us he said uh, this is uh, not some uh, enjoyment training which is going on this is an operational training tomorrow if you are required you might be using it in operations but since you are making uh, an enjoyment activity out of it please take your parachutes on your backs and move back to base there is no vehicle for you guys yes. <laughs> and uh, subsequently we realized it that it made sense next jump from you but uh, once you reach the actual uh, jumps which are conducted in agra now they are conducted from an32 mm-hmm. aircraft so helicopter is slightly a slower moving platform so when you jump it is like you are falling into a well so you mm-hmm. have got a lot of butterflies in your stomach uh an32 is moving at uh, quite a high speed so when you uh, jumping out of an32 you're not dropping you're moving diagonally and you're getting thrown against the wing which is at around 220 kilometers an hour so it's a very violent exit in an32 mm. so that violence of the exit for the first jump that i had with the an32 was really shocking to me and uh, the kind of impact it has on your body as well as on your orientation uh kind of speed which with things move mm. so it's very difficult to orient and 
Subsequently, we got a hang of it, but then that was the difference. And subsequently, one has jumped from all the major platforms in the Indian Army. So now the platform doesn't matter as much as the <laughs> jump itself. Got it. Got that it, sir. So before next year, I see that you're wearing a shirt with Chaz Balidan. If you could specify what is the significance of it and also the maroon beret. Uh, Balidan as a badge uh, just signifies your commitment to make the supreme sacrifice uh, for a mission which your country requires you to do. So it's our motto, it's our prayer, it's our commitment to the country. Got it. And uh, so that is one. So even if it, there is a mission which means ask such to make a way we make them supreme sacrifice and sacrifice our own selves, we are ready to do that. Got it. So that is one. And uh, Maroon Bere is a symbol of uh, paratroopers across the world. And also for the special forces in some parts of the world. But Maroon Bere is primarily associated with paratroopers. And it signifies that paratroopers generally would take, if you look at Second World War, mm -hmm. would undertake operations which were deep behind the enemy lines. And generally as an uh, operational parameter, we take that around 40% of the people who are jumping will not survive. Mm -hmm. So the beret which they wear signifies that it's already bloodied their blood. Mm -hmm. And they've committed that they'll undertake that mission irrespective of the outcome. So that's how Maroon Beret is looked at from that place. Got it. Got it, sir. Got it. So, sir, when you were a young officer, so how was your first experience in the combat when you went into an operation? My first experience was during probation. Okay. And uh, since I told you that I was doing probation in an operation... Uh, yeah, and yeah. So, as a task, I was given as the final task that, okay, Shekhar, now we have imparted enough training to you. We, you have been running, moving out with troops. I used to move out as a rifleman. I was not an officer when I Okay. Was so, <laughs> that you've seen in the area enough, you know the area enough. Plan an, ex uh, plan an operation. Okay. And plan, uh, plan an ambush. And it will be a test exercise as to how you are good at planning ambushes or planning an operation per se, and executing it. I said, okay. So I picked up a map and I spoke to a couple of people who were into the intelligence of things and I asked them that where is the moment and how was the terrorist intercepts coming along, where was the concentration? So, and being a Himachli myself, hills and mountains are very, very, uh, I'm very oriented towards them. So uh, I said, okay, fine. Like, this is the areas which I find and I'll Look for a ridge where I can set up an ambush. Excuse me. So, we went about setting up an ambush. We left early in the morning. Before the sun came up, we were on a ridge. And the ridge was covered with snow. And we set up an ambush in the, uh, what you call the shepherd's huts and all. So okay. We hid ourselves. And as luck would have it, by evening, we had two people walking around along that ridge. And the way we had sighted, the first party let them move in, the first body of troops, and they told me that there were two people, but uh, still doubtful if they have anything. So they came closer to my place, but then... Just... Okay. So they cl came closer to my place, and... Uh, they sat down and started seeing our shoe marks on the snow. So when they sat down, we could see their weapons coming out okay. of their parents or the gowns which they generally wear in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So the moment I saw that, I opened fire and then the troops joined in. But And then they ran back. Then the party in the rear, then they got them. And within five minutes, we had two and we came down. And my team commander at that time congratulated me for a job well done. So that was my first experience. And uh, you'll not believe it. The first experience was so exciting that the weapon was on safe. Mm. I had the person in my aim. I pressed the trigger without removing the safety. Okay. So I'm pressing the trigger and it's not firing. So then I like, yeah, why is it not firing? Then I realized, okay, go back to basics. Mm -hmm. Put it in safe. 
put the safety off then it started firing and everybody in the meantime nobody opened up till the time officer had fired <laughs> because that's my call to take Got so it. anyways so that was an experience in itself right that in excitement or that kind of thing you have to think very logically and in a very Got it. Way. So, so that was my first take Got it, sir. So if you could also explain me, uh, how did you handle any stress or tension during any operation while you were in uh, in special forces or as a commando? How did you manage to handle that? See, like I told you that uh, probation is the place where we evaluate people to take mm. stress. Right? And uh, second was that over a period of time when various events happen, sometimes you're not uh, in the direct line of responsibility, uh, but you're part of the team. So you see things happening and how your superiors are handling. And uh, my good luck was that uh, everyone of my team leaders or my uh, colleagues, all of them were professionally superlative and very, very uh, experienced. And they would... Uh, guide you, they would teach you, and they would discuss with you with an open mind as to what I was thinking. So that really gave me a confidence that yes, I can handle situations. And then I have undergone situations where the boys would get hurt, or there is a civilian who would get hurt. I have been in the Congo for one year where you had multiple civilian casualties that you had to evacuate. We came under fire multiple mm -hmm. times as United Nations contingent from the non-government forces. So uh, stress, yes, uh, it is there. But like I said, first uh, mistake of my first contact that I was not thinking straight. And then I put that as a lesson learned to myself that whatever be the situation, first you have to think, then you have to act. So once you put on a thinking hat, uh, I think most of the stress goes and then you're taking decisions as per your training or as per your experience. And at a time of stress, that is what is required. A decision is required and an action is required. If you uh, sit like a pigeon with the head buried in the sand or an ostrich head buried in the sand, uh, no, nothing positive will come out of it. So action and decisions will, will make the difference. So that Got is it. what I've been relying on. Got it, sir. So yeah. what was your favorite weapon in the operations or combat back then? <laughs> Favorite uh, weapons, people would say AK. I always had AK with five magazines, under barrel grenade launcher uh, with me. Worked with Tavor. Uh, Tavor was also good. Uh, but I remember my first weapon that was M58 VZ. Okay. So now, uh, surprisingly, it is a very less known weapon. It uses the same ammunition as uh, uh, AK-47. Mm. It is lighter than AK-47. It's got a, a same rate of fire, same range of fire, same accuracy, if not more. And I have taken on people at around 200 meters. So uh, with just iron sights, no mm. holographic sights, whatever you find in today's weapons. So, and, uh, so that's what was my first weapon in the Special Forces. And uh, that's, I think, what I liked the most. And, got it. Uh, I've carried AK for a quite a bit of time, then subsequently to war also. But uh, M58 VZ, it's a Czech weapon, Czechoslovakia. Yes. Initially, it was somewhere imported during the early 60s before it went out of production in the world. So Got it. It was really a good one. You'll find Got it somewhere, it. some places. Uh, I, I have seen some of the old, uh, you know, Special Forces guy. They have those photos, especially from 21 and 9 para guys. I have seen the photos with that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Sir, if you could also explain from your career in the Indian Army, any three life lessons that you have learned from your service, what would they be, which you still cherish? Three life lessons. Uh, firstly, is that uh, you are not in it alone. You, uh, As an officer, you are also responsible for the 10, 30, 100, 800 people that are under you are following you blindly to their deaths. They have committed on that. So it's your responsibility to send them home safely and soundly to their families. So no decision should be
taken lightly especially when lives of others were following your order mm. so that is one that ownership is there uh, secondly uh, that if you uh, got the correct intent an honest intent and which is primarily based out of the feeling that i should do right by the organization i should uh, serve the i am serving the indian army and i am serving the soldiers of the indian army uh, so uh, whatever my action should be uh, will self justify after that if i just remember this that i am serving an organization i am not serving my own purposes so uh, that is second and thirdly is that uh, the lifelong friendships and the connections that you make with seniors juniors your jawan uh, will hold you throughout your life got this it. organization ties you in that uh, cord which till your final last breath will still hold you together mm-hmm. so that's a great uh, feeling to be and one should always try and uh, be a part of that contribute to the organization wherever one may be and that's how i look at that three things got it sir i hold personally high in my table of full commitments got it sir so so my final question to you would be you know uh, what will be your message to all the aspirants who wants to join the forces be it army navy air force or coast guard okay uh, so uh, as of now uh, the country is uh, as we have seen landed on the moon and it's not it's a symbolic thing the second thing is that we are being uh, observed by the world as a growing power and as a leading power a positive power unlike other countries which are not so uh, so joining the armed forces of a country to defend it one to uh, project your national character internationally not just by fighting but by working together i worked with various armies and it's a very very satisfying experience and uh, why youngsters should join is that it will give you a way of life and if you serve for 10 years 15 years 20 years it will set you for life and it will give you a path which will never lead you astray it will have difficulties but then it will not have failures permanent failures will never be there and uh, why youngster should join is that like i said a lifelong brotherhood camaraderie mm-hmm. uh, i don't see in corporate those things happening most of the times it is just left at the college days your last mm-hmm. friends were in the college right but uh, over here it is not so every day you are making friends every day you are having new experiences every two years definitely uh, the organization is moving you from north to south south to east i see in all the four corners of the country i worked in jaisalmer i worked in nagaland i worked here in bangalore andamans all the way up to jammu and kashmir so i have covered most of the country mm-hmm. so that kind of life experience in itself is amazing and uh, it opens you up uh, to a world of uh, awareness and possibilities and like in most cases today i see youngsters if i ask them who is the vice president of india they won't know mm-hmm. so uh, i'll leave it at that that as an officer you will be a uh, fully uh, modeled ideal human being to take on any challenge in life be it in the army or in the corporate subsequently in your life and uh, personally if your definition of success is that then i think you'll be successful got it got it sir thanks a lot sir for sharing your experience in the indian army and also your perspective about it a lot of people who will watch this uh, interview will gain a lot of insight and thanks again for your time sir jai hind thank you thank you so much akash and it was really lovely and i hope that people do get inspired and uh, take that step and i'm sure that all of us will be in better hands as far as the armed forces are concerned if the younger generation today joins us sure sir thank you so much for having me thank you sir jai hind